This morning, we're going to talk about taking Christ to a confused world. Taking Christ to a confused world. I think it's pretty easy to say, and I think you would agree with me, that we live in a confused world today. And actually, a lot of what we experience in modern times is not too different to what people were like in Roman times. We haven't changed much. Human nature has not changed much over the last few thousand years. Today we have so many different truths. People have their truth, you might have your truth, and I might have my truth, and we've lost sight of what is the truth or what makes up truth. Right now in the day we live in, if you, whatever you believe, that is your truth. And as Paul was trying to witness to these people, these Roman people who believed many, many different things coming from Greek culture, they worshiped many gods. They celebrated pantheism, that all gods were accepted. And so he's talking to these confused people that had so many things to remember, so many gods that they worshiped yet they did not know the one true God. So this takes place after the events in Thessalonica and Berea that we went over last week, where Paul would witness to people, and then the Jews would have an uproar, the Jews in the city, and they would kind of send the, the Christians would send him on his way so that he could witness somewhere else while things, while things calmed down. And so we come to Paul, he arrives in Athens, and that's where we're going to start reading today, in Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art an imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris, 
and others with them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that you have revealed yourself to us, that we can know the one true God, that we don't have to worship an unknown God. Father, we pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to us, that we would know you more and more, that we would understand your character, that we would be able to tell of your works, and that we would have our eyes open to see you working. Father, we pray that you would use us as your people, as your instruments to make your name known, that you may receive the glory in all things. Please open your word to us now that we may see. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul is taking Christ to a confused world. We're going to jump back up to the beginning at at verse 16 as we go through this. The first thing, the first part of taking Christ to a confused world is we need to understand the need. We need to understand the need. Part of that is understanding our need, our need for a Savior, It is very, very difficult for someone to effectively minister to another if they don't understand the need that they have. They don't understand that they, that you, if you do not understand that you yourself need the things which you are telling someone else they need, it's very difficult to minister to them. Another thing is that you also need to understand the difficulties of the people you are ministering to. And Paul, having been Roman, he he knew a lot and will As we get into how he addressed the people, he understood a lot of the Greek literature that he was quoting, that he was referencing to, to explain Christ to them. We need to understand the the need. Just as you and I need God, they need God. So it says Paul was waiting for them at Athens, and it says his spirit was provoked. It's like the stirring of a fire. When you're getting the kindling, you're trying to get a fire to stir up. That's kind of how he felt. It was in his spirit. When he saw that the city was full of idols, he saw that they were worshiping all these different things, but they did not know God. And so just like he normally did, as we've read after city after city after city, he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, but it says here differently than it does in others. It says in the, every day he was in the marketplace, just as he had been when there was no synagogue. So he was going to the synagogue when people met there to teach, and then when there weren't people there and there were people in the marketplace, he was there over and over and over again to tell them. And then it says in verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. So when it says the word babbler, what, it really, what they were really kind of saying was crows picking up things off the field, picking up like breadcrumbs and other things like that. They were saying that he was picking up Stuff that he did not understand. It was not his own thought. He was just speaking what other people had said and trying to sell it for his own gain. That's what they meant when they said babbler. Now, there's two groups that he mentions, that is mentioned here in verse 18. The Epicurean, they believed in no afterlife. It's kind of similar to the Darwinism that we see today. The highest achievement was your own happiness and personal enjoyment. We see a lot of that kind of thought today. And they believed that gods, if there were gods, were not concerned with humans at all. Now, the Stoic thought was about harmony with all of nature, was being one with yourself. You you were aiming for full self-control, 
to be fully self-sufficient and to have emotional sta stability. Those, that was the two, uh, two prominent thoughts that they had here. And so they're saying, what you're saying to us is confusing. It's from something, somewhere we've never heard of. We don't understand this thought. And you must have gotten it from somewhere else because you're not making any sense. Because he was talking about Jesus and the resurrection. They did not believe in life after death. And so that, the idea of somebody coming back to life was very confusing for them. And so they took them to the Areopagus, which was the hill of Ares, who was the god of war, or Mars, as he's called by the Romans. And this was where they had their form of thought. Right now, our form of thoughts comes through uh, different debates, where people debate different ideas. Sometimes we have them televised. Sometimes it's in a, um, a large arena where people can hear the, the debate of different thoughts. But most of our, most of our debates of thought kind of comes and goes on the internet. That's our forum. But they didn't have that, so they would gather at this one place to discuss what, how different people thought and the different ideologies and the, the new ways of thinking and philosophies. And so they brought him here to this hill and said, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. And then Luke noted this here at the at the end here, at verse 21. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They're just trading information. They're looking for information to trade. The youth still do this today. They, they're doing it in the form of memes. They're scouring the internet. They're looking for the funniest thing, the most interesting things to read that they can find, and they send it to all their friends. And so they'll, they'll be going through and they'll say, if I see something new, I want to share it with somebody else. But if I've already seen that one before, I'm going to tell you I've already seen that before. And I'm going to kill your joy a little bit. It's kind of how I, they're not doing it. It's meaningless stuff to them. They're just doing it to pass the time. And so Paul, verse 22, in the midst of this forum, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious seeing as they had all of these idols everywhere and they had their, their own traditions. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription. And you, I, I believe this is actually still there today. In, in different cities, you can find this altar and it has the inscription to the unknown God. To the God that they don't know. They were so concerned about worshiping all of the gods. It's part of pantheism, worshiping all the gods, that they were afraid that they would miss one. And so just to cover their bases, they built an altar to the unknown God. And so he's telling them, what you don't know, that's what I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about this God that you are not aware of. And so they believed in all of these different gods who did all of these different things. And he goes on to tell them about one God who made everything. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it. If you have a different version, some versions use the word all, and you can find the word all repeatedly in here. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, or all, being Lord of everything, does not live in temples made by man. Yes, he does not live in this building. When people say this is God's house and God lives here, he does not live in this building. He does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath or, and everything. They served the gods. They would serve their gods food. They'd leave food in the temples for them because they felt like they needed to provide for them so that their gods could eat. And he's telling them, that God doesn't need anything from you. You can't give him anything. Nothing, he, there's nothing that he needs. He doesn't need you to do anything. So if you've ever seen like one of those posters where somebody's mocked up the old Uncle Sam joke saying, Jesus needs you. That's not the case. He doesn't need you. 
That's part of the gospel. It's part of the, the beauty of the story of Jesus Christ is that he doesn't need us, but he invites us. But he doesn't need anything. Instead, he gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Did you know that in the middle of the universe, as they can see it, they say there's something there that has incredible mass. It has incredible mass, but we can't see it. It's like there's nothing there. It's just this tiny thing that's holding the whole universe together. Everything in the universe is spinning. The galaxies are spinning. The solar systems from all the stars are spinning, but they're all, the, everything is spinning around this one point. And so all we can assume is that it's a black hole, but we can't see it. But if that one thing were to disappear, everything would spin out of control. Everything would just disappear. He's telling them this God gives to all mankind all of life, all of breath, everything. So the one God who created everything does not need anything, gives everything, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. He's saying he sees the nations rise and fall, and he directs it. He's in charge of it. He's sovereign. He sees where their boundaries are, where the borders are. He sees all of it. He oversees all of it. He directs everything. He determined that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. All of the evidence is in the world, but he's saying people had to search for him. Search for him and to find him. They're reaching out in the dark as if they're blind and they're trying to find what they're looking for. However, he's not actually far from each one of us. And so he uses these two quotes here, which the first one's really interesting because they actually find this in some Greek literature, but this is also found in Scripture. In him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, and this is from Aratus, for we are indeed his offspring. So he says, being God's children, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. He's pointing at these images that they created, these idols, these physical things that they would worship. He's not formed by imagination. And he tells them, the times of ignorance God overlooked. He's overlooked all of this different worship of all these other idols, all of them. I mean, there were many, many of them. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, that is to turn away from their sin, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. He will judge everything by a man, that is Jesus, whom he has appointed. So the second part of taking Christ to a confused world that we see as Paul is addressing them in this form He's where they discuss things. He's where they discuss things, and he's discussing things in a way that they understand. The second thing we must do is insert Christ into their situation. We must insert Christ into their situation. If you're talking with somebody who's confused, there's one thing you have, you have to understand is that there is only one truth, the gospel truth. The gospel never changes, but the presentation does. When we're speaking to children, when they're doing a children's church, they're going to speak to them on a level that they can understand. When you're speaking to, to someone who believes other things, that they're from different cultures, you have to speak it in a way they understand. When the saint family moved in, in, with that tribe after Nate Saint had been killed, 
And when, when they're witnessing to them, they believed that to get to the afterlife, you had to run and jump. That when you died, you would have to run and jump and bridge this gap. And if you fell, you fell to your destruction. But if you were able to jump, then you would live forever. The only problem was is that no one was able to jump it. They already believed that. And they were all just hoping that they would be enough of a warrior that they could jump and bridge that gap. And so when he came, he spoke to them about that. And he said, let me tell, tell you about Jesus who bridged the gap for you so that you don't have to jump. He spoke to them in a situation that they could understand, telling them so that they could understand Christ and the gospel. So the first thing we need to do is, in, or excuse me, the second thing we need to do is insert Christ into their situation. He's relating all of this to Greek literature. He's telling them, he's going through all of their thinking. And he explains this in a, a way. And then remember, this is a synopsis. This isn't everything he said. This is just a, a synopsis of what he said. He says in the end of verse 31, of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So it says in the righteousness of Jesus by a man whom he has appointed, he has given assurance to all by raising Christ from the dead. But in verse 32 it says, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They started sneering. They started making jokes. But others said, we'll listen to you again about this. They're going, we're going we're gonna to think over this and we'd like to hear about this again. And so it says, so Paul went out from their midst. But in verse 34 it says, but some men joined him and believed. See, we can understand the need that's something we can do. We can, we can work towards learning. We can learn about the demographics of where we, can, where we live. We can get to know our neighbors and learn what they think and what they believe to be real. And we can say, we can do our best. We can rely on the Holy Spirit to give us everything that we need to say. And we can present the gospel in the most wonderful way for them to understand. But at the end of the day, we have to trust God with the results. We have to trust God with the results. I, I cannot... I cannot preach great enough to change anybody's hearts. We can't sing the most wonderful, emotionally moving songs and change people's hearts. The only person who can do that is Jesus Christ. So we may fa face rejection in the form of mocking. Some people may say, I'll, I'll listen to this later. I'm not ready for this right now. I might have that delay. And some may believe, but we have to trust God with the results. The truth is, though, is that we live in a confused world. But God does not give us a spirit of confusion. He gives us a spirit of hope. He gives us Jesus Christ whom we can trust in and have faith in. When people are studying counterfeit to, to see counterfeit dollars, they don't study all of the many different things that could be counterfeit but they learn what it truly looks like. They learn what does the real dollar bill look like. And in the same way, we need to understand the truth in a great way so that we, way we can share it and we can interpret it for others so that they may come to know. We need to understand the need. We need to insert Christ where they're at and trust God with the outcome because it's his kingdom. And he said I will build my church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we love you. You are so, so good to us. You're so patient. You are so kind. You, are, you give us everything we need. You are the artist and we are your canvas. Father, we pray that, that we would be bold in the truth that we know in Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we would not be confused, tossed to and fro by any winds of doctrine, 
but that we would cling greatly to your word. Father, there's someone in here who's confused, who's getting mixed up with secular thought, and that's pervading their faith. Father, we pray that they would seek your word and that they would find freedom from that bondage. Father, we pray that we would have a holy desperation for you, that just as the deer pants for the water, that our souls would thirst for you and only you. And Father, as we continue to, to walk through this life among a fallen world, among fallen people, we pray that even through all of the efforts that we would trust you with the outcome. Because we know that even in our own salvation, it could not be laid on, on our, us ourselves. But just as we trust Jesus with the outcome of our faith, we can trust him now as we walk through this world. Father, we pray that you would raise us up to be a people who speak the gospel over and over and over again, whether together among believers or when we're out with unbelievers, that they may come to know Christ, that we would continue to encourage each other with Christ, and that above all things, you'd be glorified in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this time we have together. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for being a God that we can know, that we don't meet in a temple, but a God that meets us where we're at. May your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. So I've actually been to Athens, and then let me tell you, Paul.